to another Collider Heroes interview. I'm Amy Dallin. I'm Claude John Rowe. And we are joined today by one half of one of my very favorite writing teams out there and also a buddy of mine, Jackson Lansing. Hey. Welcome to Collider Heroes. What's up, Amy? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like we've been talking about this for ages. Like every time I run into Koi in the wild, I'm just like, hey, we got to do a Collider Heroes. Heroes. Like, Everyone's going to get Collider Let's Heroes. A year. <laughs> I think it's approaching a year. Thanks, Genlock. <laughs> and but here yeah, we are. We, we made found it a thing that we had to make it happen for you are writing the first Genlock comics whoop, whoop. with Colin Kelly, of course. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about this project and how it came to be? Yeah, of course. So Genlock is uh, a uh, an adaptation of the Rooster Teeth animated series, which is, uh, you know, just reared on Adult Swim. They just announced season two on HBO Max. Yeah, huge it's, congrats, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're blowing up. It's awesome. Um, Genlock is, uh, at its heart, an American anime. It's, it's taking uh, a lot of the same con- structures and conventions of, like, a mecha anime and then applying it to uh, a very like Western story. So the idea is that in the future, um, you know, some 40, 50 years from now, the world is split into two sides. We have the polity, which is effectively the United Nations. Um, it's it's what we understand as sort of like a pluralist society, futuristic, kind of cyberpunk, very positive. And then on the other side, you have the union, the union of the fourth turning republics. Uh, and the union of the fourth turning republics is a group of uh, effectively like techno fascists uh, who are very interested in you believing exactly what they believe to the degree that they might put a computer in your head and make sure that you believe what they believe. Uh, the, Fun. Yeah, the union are great. Uh, <laughs> the series opens with the union taking out uh, Manhattan, literally just going in with advanced technology that the polity has never seen, uh, taking over Manhattan, taking most of the citizens of Manhattan uh, into their army effectively, like taking them and, and stealing them away. Uh, and we have a, uh, our lens into it is a kid named uh, Julian Chase. Julian Julian Chase, uh, the guy on the cover here, right in the front, uh, is played by uh, Michael B. Jordan, who produces the series. The cast on this series is, is insane. insane. Just sign Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's insane, and we'll get to that in a sec. Okay. So Jordan crashes in his, uh, spoiler alert, crashes in his jet <laughs> in the first episode, and uh, as a result, is uh, effectively almost dies. And the polity government takes him, and for the next few years, they use what's left of his body and what's left of his mind and program it into uh, this giant robot that you might see behind you guys. Uh, that's what's called a holon. Uh, Uh, He can basically decant his mind, take his brain out of his body and put it into this giant robot body. And then he can run around and fly and beat stuff up and generally be an awesome walking tank for the the, uh, the, the fight against the Union. Uh, Genlock really begins when he gets his team. A whole bunch of new people who don't have the same uh, uh, sort of trauma that he's gone through uh, who are all themselves learning how to put their minds into these robots. Uh, and so they, as a team of five Holons, go out and fight for the polity and fight against the Union and try to keep, you know, uh, uh, truth and justice winning the day. So in, in that way, it's very much like a superhero book. Uh, it's really about fighting for core ideals, working with your friends, understanding um, who, what you're becoming as you gain more power. It's just set in this cool new science fiction universe that DC fans haven't seen before. And we're going to get into all of this, but you know something about science fiction universes and superheroes. <laughs> I because do. Because you have written for the Batman family, for Green Arrow himself. You are currently writing an incredibly exciting Star Trek book. It's been a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> and also I've played a lot of pen and paper tabletop role playing games with you, so I know you know from sci-fi universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not kidding around. All right. So I I gotta know from a futurist standpoint, because any of these sentences five years ago would seem absurd. This is a <laughs> comic adaptation that starts digital, coming out in print, that is based off of a series of American animes that take place on both multiple networks and a soon to be released HBO platform that is digital only. All of that's insane. Yes, sir. So <laughs> I just We're want living to, in the future. I just like none of that would make sense even like it Try explaining makes sense that to now. my parents. <laughs> That's, that's my question. Yeah, is yeah. it weird for you, who's you've been in the comics game a long time, which is a tangible medium, right. to be writing something that is so digital and it takes place in a digital platform as produced by Michael B. Frickin' Jordan? Is it a different animal when you're making something like this than, say, Green Arrow? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But also not at all. So uh, the, the, there are two real distinct differences here. One is just what the source material is. So with Green Arrow, it's... <laughs> dozens and dozens of years of comics that I've loved and read. Um, and that's a character that I care for and, and really know and want to dig down into, right? Uh, and so that's the IP. That's the the pre-existing uh, uh, content. And then I'm going to go into that and I'm going to find what I think is interesting. Or really, genuinely, I'm going to find what Colin and I think is interesting. Imagine there's like an invisible guy here. Like <laughs> yeah, half Colin, of my, Colin Kelly. For this, yeah, Colin your... Kelly is like the other half of my brain. We do everything together. So assume that... Would you uh, use the giant robot? Um, Ooh, 
that's the question. Good question. I'm going to bring that up to him next time we're on. We'll have a, we, we can do a debate about it. Okay. Yes. So, I want that show. On it. Uh, so that's really the only real distinction here in terms of like the source material side is just I had to watch it on Rooster Teeth. <laughs> That's yeah. all. That's the only distinction. Like I, I, I had to go on the internet and watch it, as opposed to sitting there with a book and reading it. There's nothing more or less uh, tangible about that to me, just because I work in film and television, so I'm kind of used to the script being the tangible medium. If mm. it ever comes about, then that's a, a, an extra blessing. That's a, a, a wonderful thing that happened. Oh, mm -hmm. the thing got made. Um, but the only the only time you ever really know you're going to get made is when you're working in comics. You're writing that thing. It's a 98% chance it's going to get printed, and that's exciting. Um, on the other side of this, though, it's a digital first comic. Yeah. And that is different. Hey, what does that mean? Okay, so digital first <laughs> comics are uh, a thing that uh, DC does um, uh, that are really fun, but ultimately split the release window in two. Therefore, people who are reading comics, who maybe aren't like, Wednesday Warriors aren't like people who are heading to their comic shop, aren't really knowing what they want. They don't have a pull list. They don't necessarily read comics on the daily. Maybe this is the first comic they've ever read, which for a lot of Genlock fans I know is true. Mm. They will then go on to Comixology, and that first 10 pages is going to be an episode of the comic. We call it a chapter. Every issue of the comic is two chapters. So we'll take uh, uh, chapters one and two, shove them together, boom, you've got issue one. Which chapters for the three record, and four. ships next Wednesday, uh, November 6th, and you should all be picking up, but you can get a preview of in this manner right now. Indeed. Um, so what we end up doing is creating a story that effectively runs all seven issues of the book, which the book will be seven, is seven issues by the end. That'll be 14 chapters. If you just can't wait for the print issue, if you're a Genlock fan and you want it now, Go on to Comixology. The first three episodes or chapters are already out. The fourth chapter will be out uh, uh, this Wednesday, which by this point will be last Wednesday. Uh, and, Futurism. Yep, <laughs> and comes out every two weeks uh, from there on out. So uh, the digital first version of the book will end well before the print copy shipped. But if you're a print fan, you like getting your books in print, you like going to your comic shop, you just want to put it on your pull list, not worry about any of that, great. The print issues are going to be out there for you, and obviously it looks gorgeous in print. You okay. also... There's yeah. a certain, there's a, yeah. also there's a cover on this one yeah. I gotta talk about. Speaking of things being in print, Jim Lee. Jim Lee <laughs> Jim cover. Lee cover. <laughs> Jim Lee cover. It's my first. While I'm tangenting on a Jim Lee cover. It's really exciting. What was, uh, reading that email, getting that phone, how did the, how did you handle it? Uh, they actually acted, uh, so they treated it like it was like a footnote. <laughs> I, I, I heard about it in the, no, yeah. I heard about it in the announcement. I was at RTX, which is the Rooster Teeth convention where we were announcing the books. I was getting to know the incredible Rooster Teeth fan base, all the great people at RT themselves. It was an awesome weekend, uh, by the way. RTX is like a killer con. Uh, even if you're not a Rooster Teeth fan, like even if you don't know anything they do, you will know them and love them by the end of the con. It's awesome. So we, obviously I was in a privileged position to, for that to be the case, but I had a blast. We went out to RTX, they were announcing the book, they announced Ruby and Genlock at the same time, because this is part of a, an initiative mm -hmm. with another book, Ruby by Marguerite Bennett. Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, were sitting there in the audience listening to the Ruby announcement, and they timed the Hollywood Reporter to go out with a press release at the exact same time. So Colin and I were sitting on our phones being like, can we finally talk about Genlock? Can we finally talk about, I, I kept just like posting Evangelion gifs to my uh, <laughs> Twitter and being like, somebody will guess. And I was like, all right, all right, all right, you know, can I talk about it? Can I talk about it? And finally it hits on there and I'm like, I can talk about it. And then Colin goes, what? And I look <laughs> over and he's reading it and he's gone down to the bottom where it says, and there'll be incentive variants by Jim Lee on every... <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and like we both, yeah, so we both had, but we had to be really quiet because there was a panel going on. So we're just sitting there between the two of us being like, oh my God, Jim Lee cover, oh my God, can you believe this? Oh my God, what have we done? Ah! Um, and that was on top of the fact that we already knew that Dan Mora was doing our covers, who is one of my favorite working artists. So the fact that we got to work with Dan Mora, we got Jim Lee gracing us with this incredible mecha cover, and then the interiors, which are all by Carlo Barberi, mm. who is himself a wonderful artist with a storied history, I, I think has been a really... Um, it's been a wonderful way to like kick this thing off because digital first comics can be kind of chaotic and learning how to speak that language can be um, a unique challenge. So getting to do it with such incredible artists was like a blast. So I want to hear more about the process stuff, but first, uh, what is it in the story, in the world of Genlock that really thrills you? So uh, two things big. Um, first is, as you said, I know from sci-fi universes, if you can give me a big universe to play in, I'm really excited because world building is a, is a core thing that Colin and I love to do. And we don't get a chance to do it all that much uh, in comics, frankly, just because we tend to work in like, you're not going to do that much world building on Gotham City when you're dealing with, uh, you know, Batman and Robin Eternal. Like, Although you could create your very own version of Asriel who then gets merch and we, shows up places. We, we, we could, and that was a blast. 
blast uh, and continues <laughs> to be. I just bought an entire like $600 board game just because they had a mini of our Asriel and that was a whole thing. Um, but no, I, I love the chance of getting able, being able to just dig into this world. We are just past season one of Genlock. Season two is just starting up right now. And as a result, we actually got an opportunity to get into this world early, to get the creator of the show and Rooster Teeth all on board with essaying a corner of the world that hadn't been essayed before and making that canon. So that was really exciting because it meant that we could just actually build out part of this world ourselves from what inspired us about the show. Um, that was really exciting. And then I want to speak to the second element just because it's a, it's a thing that's close to my heart and something that I, Colin and I try to work into a lot of our stories. So I was, I'm going to get heavy for a second, but um, I was born with spina bifida. Uh, I, I've, I've had it my whole life. It's a degenerative condition. I'll have it for the rest of my life. And I have a struggle sometimes with my body trying to figure out what I can do, what I can't do. I can't run, I can't jump. Um, but I used to be a soccer player, like learning how to really completely adjust the way that I live my life because of how I am, uh, how I am able is a very unique challenge. And it's something that, again, I'm very privileged. It's a really, I have it so much better than most people in my position, but it's still a struggle. And it's still something that I can speak to very like, like from my heart, a big thing about Genlock and Evan Narcisse, who wrote on Genlock season one, um, who's a friend, uh, said something that really impacted me about this. Um, in Genlock, you have Chase who cannot leave his, his, his body, you know, he has no legs anymore. He barely has a working torso. He's in a pod. And the only time he gets to go anywhere or do anything is when you take his mind and you put it in this giant robot, right? And by the end of season one, Chase is really, without getting into spoiler territory, has really adapted to that body, has really started thinking of that body as his body, not as a prosthesis, not as a, um, an addition to his body, but as his body. And a lot of stories, um, even characters like DC characters like Cyborg, spend a lot of their time being like, oh, does that mean I'm not human anymore? What does that make me? I'm a monster. That's like the classic story of my brain being put in a giant body. Um, Genlock very specifically says, no, we're not gonna tell the story that way. We're gonna tell the story of a guy who's becoming more and more human and becoming more and more himself. Uh, and what Evan said is, um, uh, I'm not, it's like, I'm the upgrade is the mm. way that Chase thinks about his uh, about himself. And to me, that's a really powerful message for somebody who deals with being differently abled. Um, so I thought that was a really exciting place to, to jump off. Uh, and then you're dealing with these four other characters who are experiencing that in their own way. How does getting into the Holons free them to be more themselves, uh, which is really exciting. I love like that. That's that's the pitch for me. Cause I so admittedly this is new to me, and I uh, I was being playing Rooster Teeth because I'm an 80 year old man. I was like, what is this? <laughs> so so all of this is really exciting because I love discovering new things through comic books, and now there's a new way to discover a new thing through comic books mm -hmm. through the digital platform branching off from a cartoon, which I think is an incredible outlet. In writing these as chapters, we were talking right before about how you write differently for the animation style yeah. because splash pages, for example, are totally different. That fascinated me. Can you dive into totally. what that relearning for you? Because you've written comics for a long time, but this is a completely new format. How has that changed things? So um, we got a little bit of a cheat code on this because um, a couple years back, we did Gotham City Garage at DC, which was a digital first series. Which you um, absolutely must read, by the way. Yeah, thank uh, you. If you love the DC heroes and alternate versions of them, which you all do, it is a my new favorite, like one of my new favorite Elseworlds. Oh, thank you. That means the world to me. We um, had an absolute blast with it. It was such a great series. Uh, and uh, and a, a lot of motorcycles. And a rotating group of artists. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's Mad Max girl gang DCU, basically. Um, it was a blast. And we, and like an amazing amount of incredible artists, Carmen Carnero, who's now killing it on Captain Marvel, Derek Robertson, like we had a lot of, Brian Chang, we had a lot of great people on that book. Um, but, all of those artists, including us, had to learn how to work in the digital first format because every page of a digital first comic, can I show this? Yeah. So every page of a digital first comic has to be cut halfway between the panel run, right? So you have screen one and screen two. You're not gonna see this whole page in the digital format because your iPhone is a horizontal screen. You're gonna see it like this, and then you're gonna see this. Then you're gonna turn the page and you're gonna see this, and then you're gonna see this, and then you're gonna see this, and then see this, and continues and continues, right? So that means that you can't do certain things that you would normally do in a comic. Um, Colin and I, uh, with apologies to Tom King, love nine panel grid. <laughs> so we are going to, I'm sorry, Tom, I have to review. Uh, we, we have to uh, avoid using nine panel, can't use it. Occasionally we'll write eight panel grid now, um, like the Morrison mm. uh, uh, from Multiversity eight panel grid, because that you can do, you can cut eight panel in half. It's four panels and four panels, but nine panels is three panels, three panels, three panels. You cut a horizontal <laughs> line through that, you've got a half <laughs> a panel. Yep, you're gonna have to decapitate <laughs> the, the character. So you can't use nine panel. Um, the other thing is like splash pages, right? 
what you wanna make sure you have on a splash page are two focuses. So you have an upper focus and a bottom focus. You have a villain reveal and the character reacting to the villain. And they can be in the same panel, for sure, they can be a splash page, but you have to find a way to sell that in digital first. Yeah. Then, when it comes back around to print, you have something really cool. Now, I'll show you my biggest cheat code, though. We figured this out on Gotham City Garage because uh, early in GCG, we were like, GCG follows um, uh, 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 Kara, um, uh, effectively Supergirl, but she's grown up as Kara Gordon. Um, she finds herself running away from the place that she's lived her whole life and, and out into the desert uh, because of stuff that's happened. Like, I don't want to spoil the book to you. Um, but she's running from Batman and she runs out and she gets out and she gets out into the desert and she's saved by this group of uh, women on motorcycles. Harley Quinn and Silver Banshee and Catwoman. And they all roll out of the desert. And we were like, I want this as a DPS. Like, I want to be able to see this and see the, a double page spread. Not I want to be able to just- per second for my RPG audience. Yeah, so I want to just take the whole two pages and dedicate it to this single image, maybe like a little run of stuff along the bottom. That would be really fun. Um, but in Digital First, how do you do that? How do you program that, right? Uh, and what we realized was Digital First was super fine with doing double page spreads. Uh, so we can do them, right? There's a oh, DPS from so Genlock fun. 1, right? And so this <laughs> is a screen, and then this is a screen, and then this is a screen, yeah. right? And as long as you can find a way to screen that out, you don't want to do it on every page because that makes it really hard for whoever actually has to do that side of things. I don't want to be a dick. <laughs> but uh, it does let you get, around, get away with more traditional comic book language so that when it's printed, ideally, you don't look at it and go, oh, this is a digital first comic. Yeah. I want you to have a really seamless experience on digital and then have a really seamless experience on print. Um, and that's the, the goal is always to find a way to do both. I don't know if we always succeed at that, but we try. <laughs> I love that perspective. And and speaking of perspective, I'm enjoying the <laughs> hell out of a book right now that is that is switching perspectives, that is causing much mystery. And mm. you were dealing with this right before all this took place. I want to talk about Event Levi Leviathan and your work leading up to it, all of that madness. Heck yeah. What was that like knowing something was coming, not being able to talk about it, having that level of secrecy, and writing a character that was going to be integral to something that you were like, well, so uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was hard. Um, I so I'm no secret to secrecy. Uh, Colin and I work in film and TV. We can't talk about ninety percent of what we do. Um, that said, as Amy well knows, uh, I'm a chatterbox who can't keep a secret to save my life. He's never broken an NDA ever in his life. Lies. Um, so for me, she there's tried. yeah, I, I appreciate that. You're 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 awesome, um, but my face betrays me. Uh, but I think what's been really cool uh, about working on Levent Leviathan, um, or working as a lead up to Event Leviathan, because I did not work on that. That was when you were writing Green Arrow? That was when I was Colin. writing Green Arrow, um, was I didn't really know that that's what was happening when we started. We started on Green Arrow, and then we were sort of starting up our run and figuring out what we were gonna do with it, and then we got uh, a notice uh, you know, from our editor, we got a call from our editor, and we were talking about it, and they were like, uh, you know, sort of interesting news, as we get up into the Levent Leviathan, Brian Michael Bendis is gonna wanna use Green Arrow, and we were both sitting there being like, yeah. <laughs> we're now, <laughs> we're now, we're, we're yeah, 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 Bendis. yeah. We're, so we're just setting up Brian Michael Bendis, right? That's what we're doing. <laughs> that's, that's like a thing that is real in the world that we're doing. Cause you gotta understand, I, I probably only write comics because <laughs> I found Bendis at the right time. Like <laughs> his work changed my life. So I'm, and continues to change my life, frankly. Um, so I've spent a lot of my life looking at his work, trying to understand how he does what he does and how to, not to replicate it, because you don't want to, you know, I got my own voice, I got my own thing I want to do, but man alive, if you're going to set somebody <laughs> up, like he's the guy to set up, that's amazing. Yeah. So it was really nice. What we had, what we ended up doing was sitting down and, and uh, understanding what he needed to go into it without really understanding anything about that Leviathan itself, but knowing that um, going into that, we needed to have Ollie stripped down. We needed to, um, you know, really break up his trust in the Justice League. Yeah. We needed to break up his relationship with Dinah. We needed to really set uh, a, a standard where he didn't have to be stuck in Seattle. Like we really had to just blow up a lot of the book, which was different than what we were initially planning on doing. So it sort of set us back and we we're like, all right, what are we really, what are we gonna do here? At which point the conversation becomes, all right, how many issues do we have to do that? Mm. Eventually we realized due to several things that the book's gonna end at issue 50. So we started issue 48, we're gonna end at 50, so our run's gonna stop pretty quickly. Yeah. But we're gonna get that issue 50, which is a huge issue, so cool. right? And, the, and, and all we get to do in issue 50 is 
end this. Just boom, <laughs> like what's Green Arrow the end? How do you blow up his house? How do you blow up his plane? How do you blow up his relationship? How do you blow up his trust? How do you blow up his status quo? How do you blow up everything? And that was like the most exciting challenge yeah. because that's the kind of thing you don't get to do on these books. If we'd walked in on Green Arrow initially and been like, we want to blow up everything, <laughs> we'd never have gotten the job. But we instead came in with this different take and that never happened. And instead it was like, you know, how do you, now that we're here, what advantage do we get for getting to do this? Yeah. And it was like, we get to take this really seriously. And so issue 50, I think is my favorite comic we've ever written. I think Green Arrow 50 is, is I'd put it up against anything we've ever done. Um, it's uh, uh, the hardest thing we've written. Fitting all of that into every page was really difficult. Finding ways to hand that off. Because it wasn't just about Leviathan we were setting up. We were also being impacted by Heroes in Crisis. <laughs> because Roy had died in Heroes in right. Crisis and that had taken up our first two issues. And then uh, we were uh, dealing with the box that had been left behind in No Justice, which had been set up by Scott Snyder and by the Bensons. So we had a lot of things to play with <laughs> and it was really on us to not say, oh, well, none of that matters. Because if we say, oh, well, none of that matters, then why did it happen? Why did Heroes in Crisis do that? Why did the box show up over here? Why are we heading into Event Leviathan with this character? Why does any of that matter to this person, to this character, and to readers of Green Arrow, to people who this has been the book on their poll? How do we make sure that all of that, uh, all of these threads that could get picked up in five years or whatever, get picked up now by us and made relevant? And that was uh, like, we didn't want to pass the book. We wanted to make sure that it worked. And to DC's enormous credit, they were deeply supportive of it. Um, and we managed to, I think, create a book that, I mean, Javi Fernandez's work alone in that book, I think kind of made him, uh, like, I think it got everybody noticing him because he immediately went over to Justice League. He immediately went over to uh, to now Dark Multiverse. Like, it, we still talk all the time, but it's like Javi's booked for like two years in advance. I don't know when I get to work with this guy again. <laughs> he's incredible. And that cover. I mean, and you well, and then <laughs> right, and then we get a Kevin Nolan cover that goes like minor league viral because like he's like taking off the mask, and then we get that Doc Shaner cover that is my favorite cover of all time. Uh, it's crazy. Scott it's crazy. Snyder, Tom King, Brian Michael Bendis, all of these artists. Like, I mean, come on, it's so, insanity. Congratulations, and now yeah, thank this, you. Like, it, it's incredible. Congratulations. It's so, been a blast. Thank you so much. We're gonna have to trick you into coming back again because there's so much more we want to talk through. You are I literally, uh, you've come from a. Uh, setting up Bendis to following up Star Trek, the original series. Uh, and as of Wednesday next week, you can get issue one of Genlock at your friendly local comic book store. Uh, you can be reading the digital chapters right now. You can dive into all of that. You can look forward to season two and you can follow Jack on the internet. Where can they find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jackson Lansing. Uh, if you want like much more personal stuff, you can find me on Instagram at found in the wild where you can see what I'm eating and <laughs> how, how cute my cat is. Very cute. <laughs> Uh, uh, content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, you can find my other half at CP Kelly. Um, he's delightful. We will seal him for that robot conversation to find out who is who. That is going to happen. And you and I are going to talk Green Hour Batman. I'm, I'm looking forward about to this. It's going down. Thank you so much for joining us today and Glad to hear us. Thank you so much, guys. And until next time, stay, stay sweaty. sweaty.